Chapter 4. Only two weeks into school and I've already failed two math quizzes. Failed with a bright purple capital F. The note from my teacher is burning a hole in my back pocket and I know I should give it to my parents. Instead, I'm sitting at the kitchen table forcing myself to finish the rest of my homework. Zach is actually humming as he does his sixth grade long division. Beth claims she didn't have homework, any homework and is outside gathering herbs in the moonlight. I can't ever remember seeing Beth in the woods before. She isn't the outdoorsy type which is pretty pathetic considering our house is surrounded by fields and woods. Mango is in my lap, purring away as I pet him. I finished reading the third chapter of Lord of the Flies, which it turns out is not about flies at all. I can't help yawning. Reading always makes me tired because sometimes I get so caught up in the rainbow-like colors of the words that I have to read passages over and over again. You really should cover your mouth, mouth when you yawn, Zach says. Why? We're not in public. He shrugs and resumes his homework. It's your soul, not mine. My soul, I said, ask. Since when do you know about souls? Oh, I know about souls, he says gravely. And I know that if you yawn and don't cover your mouth, your soul can jump out. I stare at him. Where did you hear that? The internet again? It's common knowledge, he says. You're as strange as they come, Zach. Thanks. It isn't a compliment, I assure him. It is to me, he says. I return to the sheet of my math equations in front of me. After staring at the swirls of gray for five full minutes, I throw my pencil across the room in disgust. Mango jumps off my lap and chases half-heartedly after the pencil, before lying down to wash himself. I am not a stupid person. I know I'm not. Why can't I figure out this basic math problem? Zack peers at me in surprise. Something wrong, he asks. At least that's what I think, he says. The frustration blots out everything, so that all I can focus on is this weird heaviness in my chest. The bubbling inside of me has gotten too strong. I can feel it rising to the surface. Bubble, bubble, simmer, fizz, and boom. So much for trying to be normal. That didn't last long. I push back my chair, ignore the rusty red scraping sound that reminds me of dried blood, and march into the living room. My parents are sitting together on the couch, trying to decide if they should be worried about Beth's new hobby. They stop talking when they see me. Okay, deep breath. Here goes. Just blurt it out. I wish Grandpa were here. He would know exactly what to do. I have to tell you guys something. Once the words are out, I am unable to make my lips can work again. They wait for me to continue, and I almost chicken out. But the boom is still ringing in my ears. I have no chance but to remind them of the one incident in my life I hoped everyone had forgotten. I take another breath. Remember in third grade when you guys had to come to the principal's office to get me? They thought for a few seconds. Then my father says, something about chalk? Right, I say, chalk. And at that moment, I taste the chalk in my mouth, feeling it tickling my throat. What about it? Well, remember I told everyone I made the whole thing up? Vaguely, she says, what's this all about, Mia? Well, the thing is, I begin, knowing there's no turning back now. I wasn't lying. Numbers really do have colors for me. So do letters and sounds. They are staring at me with that all-familiar Mia sprouted another head stare, but I keep talking. I bounce around the room as I speak. Each word lightens of me a little bit. I used to think everyone saw colors. Then in third grade, I figured out it was just me. My mind flashes to Billy for a second, but I don't want to confuse things even more. Not until I figure out what his story is. I thought I should tell you that about it before I got two Fs on my report card. I dig into my pocket and hand my mom the crumpled note. You have to sign this. I pop onto the armchair across from them, waiting for their reaction as they read the note together. I don't have to wait too long. Is this whole story some kind of joke to justify your difficulty with math? My mother asks with a frown. Because it wasn't funny in third grade and it isn't funny now. It isn't a joke, Mom, I reply, gritting my teeth. Do you mean to say you hallucinate? I shake my head. It's not like that. Hallucinating means you imagine things that aren't there, my father adds. I try not to lose my patience. I know what the word means, Dad, but I'm not imaginary things. My colors are as real as this house. What kind of colors are those? These exactly, my mother asks. I can tell she's still not sure whether I'm lying. I try to think of the easiest way to describe it. Each letter and number has its own color. Like a K is turquoise blue. Whether I think of it, read it, or hear it, it's just there inside my head, plain as day. They continue to stare at me, and I begin to squirm. Sounds have colors, too. I add, figuring there's no use holding back anything at this point. High-pitched sound give the sharpest colors. When I hear a noise, I'll see the shape, color and shape that go with it. Shape... My father interrupts, yes, shape, I say. The color appear in geometric shapes like spirals or balls or zigzags, that sort of thing, or sometimes just a hazy patch of colored air. 
Does this block your vision? Says my mother, asked hurriedly. Does it hurt? I shake my head at both questions. No, it's not like that. It's really, it's more, this is all your fault. My father informs my mother before I can finish the sentence. My fault? He jumps up from the couch. How are you blaming this on me? All those drugs in the 60s, she says accusingly. What drugs? He sputters. I never took drugs in the 60s. Well, neither did I, she says. I never said you did. This conversation has taken an unexpected turn, and my head is going back and forth like a ping-pong ball. Your brother used drugs, she said matter-of-factly, unwilling to give up this line of reasoning. What does that have to do with me, or Mia, he demands. Maybe you inhaled something and passed it on to her, she says, or, or, or maybe this is your crazy Aunt Polly's fault, my father responds. Maybe Mia inherited something from her. My Aunt Polly isn't crazy, my mother says defensively. She's just a little eccentric. That has nothing to do with, I figured you'd think I'm crazy, I say, trying to keep my voice steady. They glare at each other, and then they're both their faces soften. We don't think you're crazy, my father says, sitting down again. We just don't understand. He reaches out and takes my hand into his. Do you remember when this started? It's always been there, I tell him, still stinging from their words. I bet I know what this is all about, my mother says excitedly. I bet it's those building blocks you used to play with. You know the ones with the colored letters on them? Huh? I say. You probably memorized the colored letters when you were a baby. And you've been associated the colors with letters and numbers ever since. I think about that for a second and then shake my head. That can't be it. That doesn't explain, I say, that doesn't explain. I'll run down to the basement and get them, she says, ignoring me. I'm sure they're still in the old toy chest. She's off and running before I can stop her. My father and I just look at each other. Time passes very slowly until she returns. Cradling a few dusty blocks in her arm, she holds one up in front of me. Has a letter Q carved on each side in faded red. What color is this, she asks. It's red, I tell her. See, she says gleefully, I'm right. The Q is red, I repeat, on the block. But in my head, it's dark silver, like the color of Dad's helicopter. Mom doesn't say, my mother doesn't say anything. She just keeps turning the block over and over again in her head. Well, my father says after a long pause, we'll just have to go see Dr. Randolph. I'm sure he'll be able to help. Over the years, Dr. Randolph has cured us kids of everything from chicken pox to broken bones. He means well, but he's getting old and a little forgetful. For the last few years, he's called me Beth. I even heard him call Zach Beth once, but Zach denies it. Dad, the last time you went to Dr. Randolph, you said he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed anymore. Never mind that, he says. We'll have to start somewhere. I'll call him right now. He goes into the kitchen and opens the cabinet with the emergency numbers posted on it. Mom is still staring at the block as if she's trying to see what I see. I know how frustrating it is to see something differently from someone else, or in my case, everyone else, and I feel sorry for her. I have to go give Mango his pill, so I stand up to leave. Mom breaks her gaze away from the block and looks at me solemnly. Why didn't you come to us before? She sounds hurt. My throat tightens. I tried to back in third grade. No one believed me, remember? I'm glad you're telling us now, she says, reaching out to hug me. It feels good. Mom's not usually the touchy-feely type. We'll figure out, we'll find out what's going on, she assures me. Don't worry. I nod and leave her holding the cue up to the light. Mango is asleep on my bed, wheezing his mango wheeze contentedly. He springs up as soon as I open the box of tuna-favored can cat treats without my colors mango's wheezes would just be wheezes with no comforting mango puffs is that worth giving up for good grades i guess i have no choice after all everyone else manages just fine without seeing them he gobbles down the treat never suspecting a pill is hidden inside it he's so trusting i give him a few more treats without pills in them and then he yawns in my face and i wave away his icky tuna breath that night, I go to bed early and dream that Dr. Randolph has turned Mango into a stack of dusty building blocks. Every time I pile them up, someone comes and knocks them back down. I can never turn around fast enough to see who it is. By morning, my parents are still waiting to hear from Dr. Randolph, so they decide to send me off to school. On the bus, I openly, randomly open my art book to an artist I haven't seen before. I decide instantly that this is the guy for me. His name is Kandin Kandinsky, and the shapes he uses in his paintings look a lot like the ones I see when I hear noises. His images are all twisted together and overlapping, like when I hear music with a lot of different instruments. The colors he uses are flatter, more primary than the ones I usually see, but they're pretty, still pretty close. In history, we are divided into groups of four and told that each group will have to present a big project at the end of the marking period. It will be based on an event in American 
history that America would rather forget. Roger Carson is in my group along with Jonah Finley and Laura Hobson, who is always the first to volunteer the answer in class. Roger and I glance at each other, and he quickly looks down at his desk. We're supposed to get together outside of school to decide the topic. Half of our grade will depend on this assignment, but no one seems eager to make plans, least of all me. The marking period isn't over until Thanksgiving, and that seems very far away right now. During lunch, Jenna tells us about the boy-girl party she's planning for her birthday in November. Molly starts pointing at the boys she thinks should be invited when the school guidance counselor shows up at her table. You're Mia Wintel, right? She asks me. Surprise, I nod. Have I done something wrong? Have they put my history homework in the wrong pile? Your mother is here, she informs me. Then she lowers her desk and says, you have an appointment with your doctor. I gather my books while my guidance counselor waits. It's nothing, I assure my friends. I'll see you later. My mother is waiting in the front, on the front steps of the school, and she tells me Dr. Randolph has agreed to see me right away. For some reason, Beth is in the front seat of the car, her newly red hair glowing unnaturally in the sunlight. What's she doing here, I ask. She has poison ivy all over her arms and legs, my mother informs me, holding up the back door. Open the back door. Be nice. I slide in, lean forward, noting that Beth has tube socks on both her arms. So how'd the herb picking go, Beth? Shut up. Can't you cast? Can't you just cast a spell and make the poison ivy go away? I ask. Mom, Beth says. Mia, my mother warms. I lean back in my seat. Sorry. Beth looks over her shoulder. Why are you going to Dr. Randolph anyway? You don't look sick. I don't know what to do. Luckily, Mom just checks, jumps in, and says I just need to check off. Beth doesn't seem convinced. But she drops in and starts scratching the back of her hand through the sock. Mom tells her to stop or she'll get scars. That stops her instantly. Dr. Randolph's waiting room reminds me of the vets, except with kids instead of animals. A group of toddlers play with toy trains and Legos while a baby hollers in his mother's arms. I cover my ears to soften the shrill screams, but it doesn't stop the silver spears from shooting across the room. I wish everyone could see them. At least I'm not the only one here... I'm at least here. I'm not the only one covering my ears. I'm dreading going in there and having to explain everything again. The three of us sit far away from the chaos as possible. Beth has to start to start scratching again. I make sure I don't get too close. Why did you bring us to see the baby doctor? Beth asks our mother. I am wondering the same thing. Mom frowns. Dr. Randolph is a pediatrician, she says. That means he sees children of all ages, including 16-year-olds and 13-year-olds. Beth is finally called in, and my mother starts to get up with her. That's okay, Beth says. I can do this on my own. My mother sits back down with a sigh. By the way, Mia, I spoke to your math teacher this morning. I try to ignore the toddler pawing at my sneaker. You did? What did she say? She doesn't understand why she's having so much trouble, She, since you do so well in most of your other classes. She said if you don't improve, you'll have to go to summer school this year. You're kidding me. I wish I were. What's that going to do? I ask. Nothing could be worse than summer school. We'll figure something out, she promises. I'll go over your homework with you. I don't have the heart to tell her it's not going to help. I don't know what I'm supposed to do to solve the equation. Somehow I just managed to get all mixed up in the middle. Ten minutes later, Beth returns covered in pink lotion, clutching a prescription. She doesn't look happy. The nurse perks her head out the door and motions me in. I wait for my mother to join me. There's no way I'm going in there alone. Dr. Randolph meets us in the examination room. I hop up on the table and wait for him to cure me. He's always done it before. He finishes flopping through my file and then turns to me. Hi, Mia, he says, smiling his friendly neighborhood doctor smile. How are we today? I look at my mother and she gestures for me to answer. I'm fine, I tell him, relieved he remembered my name. Your father told me what's going on with you, he says, and I have to admit it has me puzzled. My shoulders drop and my mother's face falls a little, but I do my darn, I'll do my darn just to figure it out, he says, and I allow myself a small surge of help. He proceeds to give me a regular exam, checking my ears, eyes, throat, and reflexes. He listens to my lungs and heart with a cold stethoscope and even tickles my feet to see if I feel it. I do. Then he asks if I started menstruating yet. I feel my face start to burn. I don't want I don't see what that has to do with anything. No, I reply, looking away. 
I think many girls in my class have their periods already, but as far as I'm concerned, there's no rush to crush that threshold into womanhood. It sure hasn't made Beth any nicer. After that day in fifth grade, when the boys were sent out of the room to play kickball and the girls had to learn about becoming a woman, Jenna and I swore we'd never get our periods. So far, so good. Dr. Randolph makes some notes in his file and scratches his head. Then he weighs me, measures my height, and has me bend over so he can see if my spine is straight. I keep glancing at my mother but she is her wearing she is wearing her just be patient face suddenly he opens the door and slams it my mother and i both jump dr randolph turns to me so he says what did you see it takes me a few minutes seconds to realize this is a test i see brown i saw brown rings i tell him where he asks about three feet away from me in this air just hanging there in space he asks did i sense an edge of disbelief creeping into his voice just hanging there i say are they still there he asks, his eyes flicker toward my mother. No, I tell him. The sh- colors and shapes only last about two seconds until the noise keeps go- unless the noise keeps going. What color is the word doctor, he asks. I s- answer without hesitation. It's mostly hot pinkish purple because that's the color of the D, but the colors of the other letters add a gold tinge to it. Oh, and it's also kind of grainy. Anything else? else, he asks wearily. I think for a minute. Nope, that's all. I cross my arms and wait for the next question. Instead, he motions for my mother to step into the hall with him. I wonder if I failed the test somehow. A moment, a minute later, they're back. Well, Beth, Dr. Randolph begins. I think it would be best if... Mia, I correct, ignoring my mother's glare. What? He asks. My name. I say clearly, it's Mia. Of course it is, he says defensively. Now, as I was telling your mother, I think it would be best if you see a psychotherapist. I've given your mother the name of a young woman who I'm sure will be able to help you. With that, he ushers us down the hall, down out the door, and back down the hall. My head hangs low. I feel deflated, as though the air is slowly leaking out of me. So he thinks I'm crazy, too, I say to my mother as we rejoin the fray in the waiting room. No, he doesn't, she says softly, so Beth won't hear He's just trying to help. Beth hops up so that she's as when she sees us. The lotion flakes off her as we walk to the car. I didn't feel so sorry for myself. I would feel pretty bad for her. If Dr. Randolph doesn't think I'm crazy, then why is he sending me to a therapist? I ask my mother as we walk to the entrance of my old school of my school together. I watch television. I know what therapists do. Dr. Randolph only wants you to get better. He believes this is the next step. He called me Beth again, I remind her. It could have been worse, she says, turning to go. He could have called you Zach. At that point, I would have rather been called anything but crazy. It's one thing for me to call myself crazy. It's another thing entirely when a doctor does it. I pull the heavy front door right as the bell rings at the end of sixth period. I blend in with the throng and make my way to gym class. Running around the track always makes me feel better. I quickly change into my gym clothes and am the first ones out on the field. I might be crazy, but at least I can run fast. The other kids eventually file out and the track fills. As they pass Roger on the track, I decide he must have outgrown his two different socks phases. Just as I make this observation, he trips and lands hard on his side. Two kids help him off the field, and he hobbles back inside. After I change into my regular clothes, I find him sitting on the bleachers with an ice pack on his left ankle. Are you okay, I ask. He looks up and grimaces a bit. I twisted my ankle pretty bad. I could have sprained it. If he wanted to get out of gym class, there are easier ways. He smiles, and I think he must have gotten his braces off recently because his teeth look very straight. We need to get together about the history project, he says, setting the ice pack, which has begun to slip. I'll give you my number, and we can make plans over the phone. With his free hand, he reaches in his book bag, and hunts around for a pencil. I notice he has a paperback copy of one of the Narnia books. Have you read that yet? I ask him as he pulls out the book and leans on it to wipe his phone number. At least ten times, he says, handing me this scrap of paper with his numbers on it. They're my favorite books. Have you read them? I've only read the first one, I tell him. I'm not too big on reading. A brief look of disappointment flickers across his face. For some reason, I feel like I need to explain. Reading is hard for me sometimes, that's all. It's not that I don't like it. Oh, Roger says, clearly unsure of what to, what else to say. The bell rings and startles both of us. Call me tonight about the project, okay? I nod as I hurry out of gym. I don't picture myself calling him anytime soon. 
Jenna tries very hard not to pry on the bus after school. She talks about the weather, how it should be cooling coming off the bus. She tells, or cooling off a bit. She tells me her gym teacher made the girls cheer for the boys in volleyball and that she's going to file a complaint. When the doctor lets us off, when the driver lets us off at our stop, she can't hold up it in anymore. I know you tell me if something was wrong, she says, because best friends tell each other everything, right? Can we talk about it later, I say? It's kind of a long story and I need to start my art project. Just tell me one thing. Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. Am I? I promise I'll tell you everything later. Later like when? This weekend, she asks. This weekend, I hear myself saying, Okay, she says reluctantly, but I'm going to hold you to it. I know, I say, wondering if there's any chance she'll forget. Not likely. When I get home, I close myself in my room and set up my easel. As if on cue, my father starts hammering. If it's going, if I'm going to imitate Kandinsky, I'm going to have to bring him on the shapes. I turn on the radio to a heavy rock station and also put in a cassette of thunderstorm. The shapes come unbidden, as always, and I begin to paint. It's a good thing this assignment was given early in the year. After all, my colors and shapes may not be around much longer if I can find a doctor to cure me. I should record them for posterity. A word I only recently just learned means that people who come after you in history, not your rear end, which is posterior. I concentrate hard and fast and paint fast to keep up with the fleeting images. As soon as I try to capture one in my head, it's gone and morphed into another shape. After an hour, I stand back and admire my progress. It actually looks a lot like Kandinsky's work, but I bet he couldn't get a he- didn't get a headache from all the noise. I paint and paint until I fill up almost every available space on my canvas. When I turn off the music, the resulting quiet is a big relief. I lie down on the bed and let the silence seep into me like a cool breeze. Saturday afternoon rolls around all too quickly, and Jenna waits impatiently for me to start talking. The gray sky looks slightly threatening. I keep glancing up as we find our favorite log at the edge of the woods. I run my finger over the words, Mia and Jenna's log, keep away, which we carved into the soft bark a few summers ago using my father's pocket knife. One of our first PIC missions was snagging the knife from his tool shed and then returning it undiscovered. Jenna swings her legs back and forth, side to side, wordlessly willing me to speak. I had hoped to be able to tell her I'd been cured so I wouldn't have to go into the details, but I still haven't seen a therapist. Apparently, a lot of people in town have mental problems, so I can't get into an appointment until Monday. I watch ants file neatly into the ant hole by my feet and remind myself that Jenna and I have known each other forever. She is closer to me than my sister, my own sister. Much closer, actually. I open my mouth and force myself to start talking. Breathlessly, I tell her about seeing colors and how I thought everybody saw things that way, and then I found out nobody did. I felt so alone and strange. I tell her I wasn't lying that day I got sent home in third grade. She's not saying anything. So I ramble on, my hands flying around in the air. I've always wanted to tell you that your first name is the color and texture of wet grass and that your last name is purplish pink and white, like a peppermint candy. Grass and peppermint, isn't that nice? As I say that, I realize how cool Jenna is and I wonder how I could have been afraid to tell her all these years. I wait for her response. When it comes, it almost knocks me off the log. She bursts out crying. Jenna, I say, my eyes opening wide, what's wrong? She turns her face away and wipes her eyes with the back of her hand. I can see the tears are sliding down her cheeks. She sniffles and wipes again. I feel totally helpless. Finally, she faces me again. I can't believe you hid this from me for all these years, she said with an unfeeling, unfamiliar hardness in her voice. I've shared everything with you, everything. Why didn't you tell me? Shocked by her reaction, my words flow out strangely, but nobody knows. I kept it from everybody. I got used to keeping it to myself. Please don't take it personally. I'm practically begging her now. She stands up. How can I not? I thought you were my best friend. I am, I say, jumping up from the log. And you're mine. We're partners in crime. My eyes fill with tears. This hasn't gone at all as I expected. My head is reeling. Maybe you don't know what a best friend is. She steps away from me. My eye, my jaw falls falls open. Maybe you don't. I thought if anyone would understand, it would be you. Well, I don't understand, she says angrily. I don't understand why you didn't tell me in third grade or fourth grade or seventh. It's always been you and me against the world. I bet there are a lot of things you don't bother to tell me. There aren't, I insist. Jenna and I never for 
have never fought before, ever. I can feel my hands start to shake. I have to go home, Dennis says suddenly. She hurries along the path back to our houses. I run to the edge of the woods and wait for her to look back, but she doesn't. I'm so shocked. I don't know what to feel. As I walk home, I decide on anger. By the next morning, I change my mind and choose disappointment. And after school on Monday, after Jenna has ignored me all day, I decide I'm very, very hurt.